History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No, it's deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We're digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. I'm Phil. And I'm Matt. We're not historians. We're just two guys who enjoy a great story and plenty of laughs. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is The Man Who Made History's Deadliest Weapon. So I want to start right from the top and just say that (laughs) on today's episode, we're going to be talking about guns. And I know that's a potentially hot topic for some people, whether you are feel very strongly one way or the other about guns. So if that's something that you feel that you will be, I don't know, overly emotional or passionate about and listen to this episode, take that for what you will. <laughs> it's going to be a conversation probably early on in the episode, and then we're just going to get into the history of one specific gun, which will be kind of the main topic today. But Before we do that, we will have a little conversation like we usually do when it comes to these types of moral debates in our episodes. So before we get specifically into (laughs) guns, you're just laughing at me. (laughs) Hey, you know, you got to be up front with them. Yeah, I mean, I think... You're a straight shooter. A lot of our listeners probably feel the same way we do. Oh, you're terrible. (laughs) (laughs) I think a lot of our listeners probably have very similar opinions to us, but you never know who's listening to different things. And obviously we are not the most intelligent people and always speak for yourself with the the zeitgeist. Do you like that word of how the, how the country feels about every topic, but I think we are pretty even keeled and we can have good conversations about potentially, I don't know, pressing issues. Anyway, so before we get specifically about guns, <laughs> let's talk about war ethics a little bit. There's a common phrase Ooh. that says that um, all is fair in love and war. And as much as people like to hear us talk about our love lives, we're going to talk about the second part of that. And I want to ask you, do you think that everything is fair when it comes to war? I mean, I guess I don't like. I don't necessarily agree with even having the conversation about what is fair Um, because the entire paradigm of war kind of relies on it being a last resort way to coerce somebody into something or another country into something. And like, once you're actively at war and killing another country or another community's people and them yours, I don't really know, like, I I mean... (sighs) I don't want to say it's no holds barred because I do agree with like war crimes and war laws to keep things at least not civil, but as civil as they can be. But I don't know. I feel like calling war fair is goes against the point of war in the first place. Not calling war fair, but just saying like, is anything that takes place during war ethical like can anything be considered ethical or is everything ethical because it's war i guess that's kind of the phrase there is that in times of war you do what you have to do and it doesn't matter whether that would be ethical well i mean i don't know i'm going to take a very like subjective morality viewpoint on this and that's that it kind of depends on the two countries or however many countries are fighting the war um agreeing i guess on rules i don't know that you can say that you know, the, the rules of war are ethical. Cause I, I mean, I don't know that I would say that because I inherently think it's unethical to kill or take another life, whether you're at war or not. Now, I mean, war has just been a condition of being human, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to call war moral or ethical. I think it's just an agreement between the entities fighting it. So I guess it's, more subjective in my opinion. Well, you also mentioned it being kind of like a last resort type thing. Are you saying that it should be, or is that typically how it's treated? No, I just think it is like, 
I used to think when I was younger, like when I was little, why, like, why couldn't the the presidents of the different countries play chess to solve these problems? Like, if we want to take over, if we want to, I don't know, stop Germany from having a Holocaust, why didn't they just play chess? Like, that would have been a much, I think, <laughs> more ethical, calm way to do it. And I remember thinking that as a, as a kid, but then you get to this realization that, well, if, if you know, Hitler lost the chess game, <laughs> theoretically they have the chess game and Hitler lost, he has more options now. Like, he can go further than the chess game. Right? <laughs> he could flip it and punch the president of the U.S. Or he could take it to war and start attacking the United States and its citizens. And that's why I think war is just de- a de- it's It has to be the last resort. Because what could you do, I guess, beyond... Yeah take the lives of another country's citizens, you know, like. Well, who do you think would be a better chess player, Winston Churchill or FDR? That's a good question. That's actually a really good question. Winston Churchill, right? I don't know. FDR was a smart man. Why does it have to be FDR or why does it have to be Winston Churchill? I don't know. I think of chess as like a, uh, I don't know, a, a royal type game and he comes from the monarchy of England. So <laughs> maybe I don't think, he, I don't he think grew FDR up was like a pauper. <laughs> <laughs> no, but <laughs> I would just, I don't know. I, I That would be an interesting chess match to watch, even though it has nothing to do with the conversation that we're currently having. <laughs> My vote is FDR. <laughs> maybe we can so, make that a bonus episode. <laughs> <laughs> You also mentioned war crimes. So obviously war crimes is kind of where we draw the line of what is or is not ethical in times of war. And I think that kind of just stems from, I guess your point is that if war is the end all be all to a conflict, it's kind of like if if we were to do chess instead of a war, people need to agree to the rules that the chess game decides it. So right. war seems to not have any rules because like you said the effect is just that you're you're killing the other country's citizens and that's kind of how you solve this dispute but it's it's odd to me that we use war crimes as like rules to the game of war and how do we define what that is yeah i mean i maybe might be like contradicting that point with what i'm about to say but i feel like even if you're going to have the war it's good to like i think most parties recognize that it's it's a horrific thing and the war crimes and war laws that we have are basically our way of agreeing to keep it as least horrific as possible <laughs> right like we don't need genocide and you know poor treatment of prisoners of war um the same way as like if you're going to fight with your partner like there are things you can do to like have a healthy fight and be heard and have it be fair without being unnecessarily damaging. You know what I mean? Yeah, I guess, I don't know when it comes to like war crimes, I I don't have too much to say on it. I think it's pretty obvious that we're going to say that anything in war crime territory is pretty inherently bad (laughs) and there's not really any way that you can like justify (laughs) taking those actions. I think other than just viewing it as like the, the end all be all like the you know if people aren't following the rules if they're willing to commit these war crimes then it's it's true to say that everything is fair in times of war because people are getting away with it so i guess the whole point of that conversation is just that when we talk about what's ethical in war times and how much destruction or loss of life you can stomach because it's war times how does that translate to everyday life so that's a, that's a tough problem for a lot of former military people is adjusting from military life to civilian life and things that were maybe more acceptable or you had to endure some pretty terrible stuff in wartime you adjust back to civilian life where you know, killing people is a very different thing in the middle of New York City than it is when you are in a battle zone. You know what I mean? Like, it's just a a totally different life and we perceive even slightly, not even to the point of murder, but slightly more humane things as not normal behavior in everyday life that would be acceptable in military. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm not 
super close to a lot of people that have actively served during my lifetime. Um, I mean, obviously we can recognize that there's a huge mental effect of the dynamics of war, especially in, you know, returning veterans having pretty severe PTSD on a regular basis. But I mean, I don't know. I, I guess, I, I guess I don't think the ethics change. I guess it's just during wartime, the people involved have to suspend their normal ethics and play this game. Like we've used the chess reference or metaphor. Mm -hmm. You have to like, if you're going to be involved in that and do it, I mean, you know, whether you're doing it as a career or because you feel you need to serve your country in that way, like you have to be able to suspend, I think your civilian morality, you know? Yeah, no, I, I think that's part of the, the, I guess the big deal with military is retraining the way that you think in situations like where most people are brought up with a certain standard of what is moral and ethical. And you kind of have to retrain your brain to for war times that you're going to be doing things that you wouldn't do in a normal society or that, you know, there might be yeah. some atrocities, not necessarily that you are committing, but that you're going to have to face or you're going to have to deal with. Um, and I just think that that's a hard adjustment to get to that point, number one, but then to transition back into civilian life when you are done serving the military, it's not an easy thing for anyone to go through, right. particularly, you know, active combat veterans. Yeah. So I guess just transitioning a little bit here to civilian gun owners, because we, we seem to have, I guess, a little bit of a problem in our everyday society of people that think that they are military <laughs> or... <laughs> think that they need military grade equipment, even though they are civilians. Um, I, I think you and I have similar philosophies on this. I, it, we should probably preface this in this entire episode with the fact that neither of us are, I mean, I don't know if you own a gun or have really fired one, but I am not a gun person. I don't own any. I don't really know how to fire one. The only time I've handled one was in a court case when I was a <laughs> sitting on a jury. So I, I'm not like super knowledgeable about guns other than the one that I researched extensively for this episode. I have shot them. I do not own one. Um, but I have shot them. I know how to fire. Mo I mean, I don't want to say most cause there's a lot of different types, but I've fired a handgun. I've fired a shotgun and a 22 rifle. Um, and frankly, as for sport, um, like skeet shooting with a shotgun is actually kind of fun. You know, it's, it's something that I enjoyed when I did it. Um, but I'm torn on the personal gun ownership. I don't own one mostly because I don't, I think if you're going to own one at all, you have to be ready to use it when you need to use it or it just becomes a liability. You know, mm -hmm. it either becomes a safety liability or it becomes a reason for somebody else to get a little bit more aggressive with you if they know you have it or if you pull it out. And I think a lot of people have this fantasy about owning a gun to protect yourself, but don't really consider the philosophical, moral and emotional implications with it. And that's yeah. why I don't own one because I think in, I don't know, it seems prudent in our current political climate, maybe to own one. Um, and I understand why certain people, feel the need to, at least for personal protection, depending on where they live and their lifestyle. And I think it's fine if it, like I said, if it's for sport, if you hunt, great, own a hunting gun. Um, if you like to shoot, you know, targets and target practice, great, own a twenty two. I don't, I do not see a reason why anybody needs to own a semi-automatic or an automatic weapon. Yeah, I think you and I have very similar opinions on that aspect. I, I mean, the reason that I don't own guns and probably never will is essentially that, like, I don't remember if we've talked about this on the podcast or not before, but the reason that I don't want a gun is because I am not prepared to use it to end someone's life. And right. like, and that's, that's why we'd use it for self-defense. I don't have interest in going to shoot at a range. I'm not a hunter like that. If that's your thing, by all means, like it's a hobby. I own golf clubs. <laughs> that's how I view it. Like if, if you want to go shoot at a range or whatever, yeah, you own a gun for the same reason that I own golf clubs so I can go hit balls at a range. Like it, it's a, it's sport, it's a hobby. 
But right. if you're owning guns because you feel the need to defend your home from invaders or a <laughs> tyrannical government, whatever, like you need to be prepared to use it and use it in a way that would end someone's life potentially. And that's not like anything that I can see myself doing. And if I'm not prepared to use it, I shouldn't own it. So th- I guess that's just kind of my thought on it. Maybe if it was my hobby, I would be more into it, but I just don't really care yeah. to go shoot at a range. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I get the argument that like they're out there and it would be difficult to get them to not be out there completely. So the personal defense thing I get, I don't, I no longer understand the tyrannical government argument <laughs> because a lot of the same people who make those arguments are people who support further strengthening the U S military and like what <laughs> tyrannical government would you be fighting against? At least at this point. And the second part of that is that we're, we're done with that. We're it's beyond that. The federal government, or at least whoever controls the military has control of hundreds and hundreds of nuclear weapons and you can't (laughs) it's over it's already done they track us with our phones and our credit cards and our internet history they don't need to even physically attack us to be tyrannical if they want to right (laughs) i just think that's a silly argument (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that clarifies, I guess, how we stand on gun ownership. But why do you think America has a gun problem? Do you think America has a gun problem? And if so, why? I personally believe that America does have a gun problem. I think we have, or at least a lot of our population has a fantasy about the use and the ownership and, you know, There's this very American, like, I'm going to be the hero and defend my family or defend something, arm the teachers, (laughs) kind of (laughs) like bravado almost. And I mean, I think the fact that it was written into the Constitution fuels that fire more. I also think that the mere existence of the NRA is a lot of the reason why we have the attitude we have, because they've spent a lot of money doing, you know, marketing that idea and that's almost the entire point of the nra's existence but i do think america has a has a problem in terms of how many guns are out there and how many how easy it is to get one and who can get one Mm -hmm. i don't advocate for complete outlaw of i don't think we should send in the i don't know (laughs) some force to collect everybody's guns but yeah, no, I, I mean, I don't think that that is necessarily the solution. But when you do look at countries that don't have the gun violence that we have in America, typically they just don't have guns. And I think part of the reason right. we have so many issues with, you know, mass shootings or even just your everyday homicides is because guns are so available to basically anyone who wants them, particularly illegally. And that that's kind of the argument right. when you talk about taking away guns, people say, well, bad guys are still going to get them. And that, that, yes, they are because guns are there. You don't have that problem in other countries because guns aren't there to begin with. So I think, right. I mean, there there are tons and tons of reasons why there are gun problems in America. But I think the underlying issue was just right from the start, we put guns and firearms into the Constitution and made it an American thing that we were so proud to be this budding nation that fought for its freedom against a tyrannical government that we had to embed that into the constitution. And once you, you know, open that Pandora's box of flooding the entire country with guns or making guns available, free access to it, then you have a country that's full of guns and it's impossible to get rid of. And it becomes this problem. I think just other countries never had that to begin with. And we're, we're approaching that problem in the wrong way by saying, get rid of the guns or take the guns away from law abiding people because guns are already there. They're already available. So I don't have the answer. I don't know how we fix that but it's clearly an issue because of access yeah and i i I don't know i think it's just a spectrum of ease of access and i disagree with the viewpoint that like because guns happen to already be there and bad people might sometimes be motivated enough to get them means we should have no control whatsoever like there is every step every extra step of control will prohibit a part of the population 
mm-hmm. no matter how small from doing it. Like there's a, there's a, there's a threshold out there where there's a guy who might get one cause he's pissed off one night and is having a mental breakdown where he might not. If you know, you needed to go through a process to, to own one and that's one right. less. And I think that that number is compounded over 300 million people. And I don't buy that a, a simple law would at least deter some of those people from not having access right. to them. So I guess before we get into this whole thing, <laughs> this whole side conversation, this is, it, it's relevant to today's topic, but it isn't necessarily what the topic is about. Um, I do want to talk about one situation from American history, since we're on the topic of, you know, civilians owning guns and these criminal mass shootings, this type of thing. Um, I want to talk about one specific mass shooting that took place in America in October of 2017. Um, So a lot of our listeners are probably very familiar with the story, obviously very recent in American history, only a couple years ago, but it took place in Las Vegas. Uh, It was an incident that lasted only 10 minutes where a 64 year old man fired over 1000 bullets from the 32nd floor of a nearby hotel into a crowded concert venue in which he killed 60 people, wounded 411 by gunfire, and wounded an additional 456 just through the ensuing panic. Hmm. This attack was the deadliest mass shooting committed by an individual in U.S. history, but it was also especially notable and made headlines because of the perpetrator's use of a bump stock on his weapons. So people might be familiar with that part of the story because for a time we did ban bump stocks in the United States immediately after this. And that was one of the first times that we had legislation passed immediately following a mass shooting like this. I'm pretty sure bump stocks are now legalized again, at least in certain circumstances. Um, but for those who aren't familiar with it, basically it's a it's a device that you can affix to your rifle that enables the use of recoil on a semi-automatic firearm, which would allow it to then fire ammunition cartridges in rapid succession. So essentially it allows a semi-automatic weapon to mimic the firing motion of a fully automatic weapon and then can fire at rates between 400 and 800 rounds per minute. Turns what should be a, I don't want to use the word safe, but a legal to own by a civilian and less dangerous weapon into a weapon that really isn't legal to be owned by civilians is military grade. And that's yeah. why, I mean, that's why this event was so dangerous and was so bad. Um, and it's what led to these, these devices being banned for a time. I'm not really sure why that got reversed, but I would guess it had something to do with certain parties controlling the house and certain <laughs> um, funding organizations, like you mentioned earlier, <laughs> being able to channel some money in certain places. Which funding organization? <laughs> it's not the National Restaurant Association, I'll tell you that. It's not. No, it isn't. So the reason I bring up that particular incident um, centers around the the bump stock mimicking a fully automatic weapon. And a fully automatic gun, we're going to talk about really the first one in history today. We're going to talk about the man who shaped the history of mankind through his invention of this. And I don't know that he necessarily intended to shape history in the way that he did, but maybe he did intend kind of his invention to turn out the way that it did. So we'll get into all that. He's kind of an interesting character for sure. Um, But because this is a Phil led episode, and I know this is one of our longer (laughs) intros already, but because it's my episode, naturally we're going to talk about someone that isn't our main topic before we get into (laughs) (laughs) the person we came here to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about a different inventor, a different gun maker, whose name was William Cantello. Cantello was born in 1839 at Newport on the Isle of Wight, which is the largest island in England. He was married with three children, a daughter and two sons. He was the, he was an engineer and also the landlord of the Old Tower Inn, which was a pub, typically in England at this time, inns were all pubs. Uh, But underneath his pub, he built a small workshop, and he spent most of his time there tinkering and working on experiments with his sons, who were also engineers. Now, at this time in history, militaries around the world had been seeking inventors to develop more powerful and efficient rapid-fire weapons. One gun that we mentioned on an episode a couple weeks ago, or at the Civil War, called the (laughs) Gatling gun, became very popular after its use in the Union Army. And the Gatling gun had 
six or more barrels that rotated around a center shaft. It resembled an early rotary cannon, but it was able to fire continuously without needing to be manually reloaded each time. Uh, so this was really the first version of what we think of as a machine gun. Um, it it was operated by a person who would turn a crank, so it wasn't truly an automatic weapon. You had to have someone who was actually operating the gun that through his yeah. actions was reloading it. It wasn't the gun reloading itself. So Cantella was working to develop a gun that would be self-loading in this way, a fully automatic machine gun. Funny story about the Gatling gun that I just wanted to include in this, and I think I kind of teased it in that Civil War episode, was that the man who invented the Gatling gun, surprise, surprise, his name was Gatling, um, he actually invented it <laughs> intending it to save lives, if that makes sense. He thought that Interesting. His, <laughs> he thought that his gun would be so effective in ending wars quicker because it was efficient <laughs> that with the wars ending quicker less people would die so i mean i think he maybe regretted his invention i didn't research him too much i just know that he thought that by inventing this more powerful rapid fire weapon that it would save lives and in effect it kind of led to further inventions that we're going to talk about today that were a lot more dangerous <laughs> So anyway, Cantello and his sons kept their work a secret, but it was believed that they had been working to develop a fully automatic machine gun, like we mentioned. His gun would use the energy of its own explosive recoil to automatically reload the next bullet, firing continuously until all of the bullets ran out. And according to his family, he completed this invention in the early 1880s. However, immediately upon the completion of his gun, Cantello disappeared. There was a couple varying accounts as to why he disappeared. Some accounts say that he took an extended vacation as a reward for completing his project. Other people said that he simply just went off to sell his invention. But either way, yeah. the family never saw him again. Shortly after his disappearance, a large sum of money was transferred out of his bank accounts, and the family actually hired a private investigator who tracked him all the way to America, but otherwise found nothing. <laughs> So he just disappeared? This is fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. This guy apparently invented this fully automatic gun and then took off and nobody saw him again. <laughs> he didn't want to make any money off of this, I guess. I don't know. I mean, you would think so, but it's just really weird that he just kind of disappears at this point. And we will circle back to him. There's a reason that we talk about him, even though he's not today's main topic. But yeah, kind of just a weird little story about some guy that was around inventing a very similar gun at the same time of today's main topic. Mm. So we will get into that main topic, a man named Sir Hiram Stevens Maxim, after we take a short break. We'll be right back. So our listeners are pretty used to hearing us talk about what we're drinking on the on the episodes that we record. And usually it's beer, or wine, or some sort of spirit. Sometimes that has to do with the B-sider of the day. But today I'm just drinking a cup of coffee. And to be honest with you, Phil, it's the single worst cup of coffee I think I've made for myself <laughs> in several years. Oh no, is it truck stop coffee? Because I've had a lot of experience <laughs> drinking truck stop coffee recently. Honestly, I don't know how I did it, but this might be worse than truck stop coffee. It doesn't have the metallic taste, <laughs> but... It's definitely, it, it's on par with uh, a terrible gas station cup of coffee. That sounds disgusting. It's delightful. Maybe you should uh, buy some coffee or someone should buy you coffee. You know what? I like that second option a little bit better. And it works out because we're here today to tell our listeners about a new listener support service we're using called Buy Me A Coffee. And you can find us and buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. And it's cool because there's a couple different ways that our listeners can get involved and support the show. Number one, you could just donate to the show by clicking buy them a coffee. Two, you can join as a member with levels starting at $5 per month. A few of the membership perks include monthly bonus episode titled History's B-Side Battles, in which we debate to see which B-Sider would come on top in a battle royale to the death. You also get access to our future episode queue, discounts on extras on our online shop, and history's B-side gifts and swag. 
And those extras, like you mentioned, include things like choosing topics for future episodes. You can buy custom postcard sets or stickers. And we even have some things like coffee mugs or some future merch that we're going to add on there as we go. And you obviously don't have to be a member to get those things. But if you are a member, you get a discount on them. And it's actually a much better deal, 25 to 50% off what you would if you weren't a member. It's a great way for our listeners to support us in a more casual way and make sure that we're not recording while drinking terrible cups of coffee like the one I have in my hand right now. <laughs> the website again is buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. We so appreciate your support. It's what helps us continue to put these episodes on every single week and continue our research and make sure you're learning about all the cool people from history that we sometimes forget. With that said, let's get back to today's b-sider. All right, so as we mentioned, today we are here to talk about Sir Hiram Stevens Maxim, who was the inventor of a very famous gun. But before we get into all that, we're going to talk about his earlier career and some of his other inventions, because he's he's most known for his invention of his gun, but not so much for all these other crazy inventions that he had, and some of them were really cool. <laughs> Maxim was born on February 5th of 1840 in Sangerville, Maine. His parents were Isaac Weston Maxim and Harriet Boston Stevens Maxim. He was the oldest of eight children, and his family was very poor. So he actually didn't have much formal education. He only went to school for less than five years. But it was apparent from a young age that he had a knack for inventing. He liked to tinker with different things. Hmm. At age 14, Hiram began an apprenticeship with a carriage maker, where he worked 16-hour days, made a monthly wage of $4, and learned just how much he hated labor leaders. <laughs> <laughs> As we all do. Yeah, and that would be something that continued throughout the rest of his life, although it's not particularly pertinent to a lot of his story. Uh, after he left this job, he traveled around the Northeast, and in Canada, he took various jobs and worked on several different inventions. So throughout his early career, while he is gainfully employed... He does have some of his first inventions that we'll talk about in a little bit that he does start to put together and patent and be notable on his own for, for those inventions. In the 1860s, he took a job as a machine worker with his uncle Levi Stevens in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. And this kind of mechanical engineering was common with his family. His father was a mechanic. His brother, Hudson Maxim, was also an inventor. And his future son, Hiram Percy Maxim, would become an inventor as well. Unfortunately for Hiram, his uncle would eventually fire him on the advice of a spiritualist. But he did find a steady job as a draftsman for a shipbuilding company where he worked with illuminating gas machinery. Hmm. So I'm going to pause in his little biography here to talk about specifically some of the inventions that came out earlier in his life and while these aren't as famous or he's not as well known for these inventions as he was for the gun that he would later invent these are all important inventions and kind of shows the amount of work that he did as an inventor beyond just working these machine jobs or eventually coming out with this gun so this section won't necessarily be chronological but it's all important and plays into his larger story Maxim received his first patent in 1866 for his invention of a curling iron. And some of his other smaller inventions included things like an apparatus for demagnetizing watches, uh, devices that would help prevent the rolling of ships. Um, what? How did those work? <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't really know how they work specifically, but rolling of ships would be like once the ships are in the water help keeping them upright from capsizing rolling in the sense means like turning over because of the waves not like rolling them okay. down dry land to get into the water <laughs> so gotcha. it was something to help stabilize ships basically uh he also invented some aircraft artillery an aerial torpedo gun coffee substitutes what were the coffee substitutes <laughs> so they you could still buy stuff like this it's it's not like tea, I guess, but it would be like something that you could drink in place of your t your coffee. Like if mm. coffee is bad for your health or you're in a situation where coffee is not accessible to you, I guess you could buy these coffee substitutes. But I, I don't really know how to describe it, and I can't imagine that they are satisfying in the way that a good cup of coffee is. Yeah. 
Uh, he also invented a mouse trap, an automatic steam powered water pump, vacuum pumps, various oil, steam, and gas engines, and two variations of an inhaler which used menthol or pine vapor combined with steam. So this particular invention is important because Maxim was a longtime sufferer of bronchitis, and he claimed that this inhaler could help relieve asthma, tinnitus, and hay fever. Some people accuse this invention of being quote-unquote quackery. I like to think of that as like <laughs> modern-day essential oils people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Maxim responded to these claims by saying, quote, It will be seen that it is a very creditable thing to invent a killing machine, and nothing less than a disgrace to invent an apparatus to prevent human suffering, end quote. I feel like in our society, at least, this is actually pretty true. Do you think that it's because it's very easy to end a human life, but quite difficult to save one? Uh, I agree that this quote feels very true. Like, it, it does seem like we remember the gun makers, you know, but I don't, but not so much like the people that invented healing remedies, I guess. I don't know right. why that is. I don't, I don't, I mean, maybe it is easy to end a human life but there's a lot of ways to do it besides just the guns <laughs> right um i don't know part of my guess is just that you know guns are typically named after people like the gatling gun that seemed right. to be named maxim gun you got the smiths and the wessons and the <laughs> all the other <laughs> famous guns that we know of they're all named after people i don't know i i, I I agree with the quote and it's kind of like a bum 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 ominous quote out of his story <laughs> because we know what's coming next but yeah i don't know why why i mean why do you think we view it that way why do you think it's more creditable to invent a killing machine than a life-saving device i mean i think it might go back to tie into that like we were talking about why is it why does america or the united states have a very specific unique view on guns and i think it's just because of the violent nature of the way we started our country and you know we were kind of on this frontier where we i mean did end up in a lot of conflicts to build the united states whether we were right or wrong to do that but it, it was a violent process and i think the birth of our nation while it means other things also means an a certain level of violence. So I think as a country, we've always valued, you know, strength in war over some other countries. Yeah. It does seem to have a bit more like drama to it. What's, what am I trying to action? You know, like there's yeah. something exciting about a gun being invented versus an inhaler or something like that. <laughs> Even though one should be much more noble than the other, Right, It's not quite as exciting. And I think part of that too is just that like the average person can understand how a gun works. You know, you pull a trigger, it shoots something, makes a loud bang, and hopefully you hit the target you're aiming at. I feel like medical things are a lot harder to explain and understand by the average person. Like yeah. a, a gun is a mechanical thing, something that's going to be invented to prevent human suffering or to help a life is you have to understand how the body works and it's a lot harder to right. see like an immediate satisfying reaction to your invention in that way. Yeah. My other thought had stemmed from money, but I mean, we spend so much on military and clearly other nations were too, if they were looking for these guns to be invented. Uh, but the medical field is huge too. Like there's got, there, clearly you can make good money by inventing medical devices in the same way that you right. can by inventing weapons. So I'm not entirely sure why this would be, viewed as more creditable to invent a killing machine versus a apparatus to prevent human suffering. <laughs> but I, I think right. there is some truth in his quote here. Yeah, I agree. So Maxim also had some claims to inventions that he did not receive credit for. When a large furniture factory in his town had burned down on multiple occasions, they actually hired him as a consultant to help prevent it from happening again. And he invented the automatic fire sprinkler, which would douse the flames and alert the local fire station. He unsuccessfully attempted to sell this invention to other businesses, but the idea of using these automatic sprinklers to put out the fires didn't catch on until after Maxim's patent had expired. So, 
it's funny because you you go in almost any commercial building today and you see these big sprinklers. You might have some in your apartment or in your apartment building yep. somewhere. I have one right above me. <laughs> I remember we had one in our apartment, but it's like that seems like such an obvious invention, but he never had it catch on. And it's funny that he doesn't, he never got any credit for something like this that again right. is, p- could be seen as an apparatus to prevent human suffering. <laughs> yeah. His other and more important invention for which he did not receive credit was likely the incandescent light bulb. And I will say that this is actually where I found Hiram Maxim. I thought this would be a great B sider as the person who possibly invented the light bulb before Thomas Edison. Yeah. Turns out he did a whole bunch of other stuff that made <laughs> him a more interesting B-sider. <laughs> but I thought this was a cool story too. Uh, so in the late 1870s, Maxim installed electric lights inside the Equitable Life Building, which was the first such lights in New York City. Maxim and Thomas Edison were involved in lengthy patent disputes regarding the incandescent light bulb. Maxim claimed that one of his employees had accidentally filed the patent under his own name, Then Edison realized the error, disputed the claim, and knowing that that would make the invention public property, Edison then manufactured his own light bulb and filed a new patent. So Maxim claims that Edison is credited with being the inventor simply because he had better knowledge of patent law. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know who I want to give credit to on that one. I think think we can give that one to Edison, but I don't know, maybe Maxim was the guy who did it first. And in kind of an indirect connection to the last inventor that we talked about on History's B-Side, Maxim also attempted to invent a flying machine, going back to Ooh. Reverend Burl Cannon from a couple months ago. So Maxim's father actually originally developed plans for a helicopter, but never attempted to build it. In the 1980s, Maxim built an aircraft that was 40 feet long with a 110-foot wingspan and was powered by two lightweight steam engines. This machine was able to lift off from the ground, but Maxim concluded that a successful aircraft would require an internal combustion engine, which he never attempted to develop. While working on this flying machine, though, Maxim tried to fund it and promote his work by building a captive flying machine as an amusement park ride for the Earl's Court Exhibition of 1904 in (laughs) London. That sounds terrifying. Yeah, essentially this was a large spinning frame from which cars would hang and swing outward, which kind of simulated flight, but because it was still attached to the frame, it wasn't actually flying. Uh, That's why it was called a captive flying machine. Maxim would get bored with this project and referred to it as a, quote, glorified (laughs) merry-go-round. But interestingly enough, four of these rides were built and opened across England, all of them opened in 1904. One of them in Blackpool on the west coast of England still operates today. And this is kind of funny because we did a whole episode on Disney and we mentioned Disney in our last episode about Robert Smalls. So Disney engineers inspected this specific ride, the one that's in Blackpool, uh, Hmm. before building the Golden Zephyr, which is a modern day recreation of Maxim's ride. And it's located at Disney California Adventure Park, which opened in 2001. So there's a little bit of Maxim in Disneyland, California. Yeah. (laughs) So we'll get back into Maxim's career here. We left off with him working for a shipbuilding company, working on illuminating gas machinery, which are basically lights. By 1878, he had been appointed to be the chief engineer of the United States Electric Lighting Company, which was the first company of this new industry. Here, he invented a method of manufacturing carbon filaments, which led to his dispute with Edison over the invention of the electric light bulb. And with this company, he traveled to the Paris Exposition in 1881 to exhibit another invention, an electric pressure regulator. While at this convention, he met a fellow American who told him, quote, Hang your chemistry and electricity. If you want to make a pile of money, invent something that will enable those Europeans to cut each other's throats with greater facility. (laughs) And this idea inspired Maxim to turn his attention to automatic weapons. Oh, good. (laughs) Here's the uh, origin story for our great villain, Hiram Maxim. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. This same year in 1881, Maxim moved to England, which he always preferred to the United States, and he began to work on his most famous invention. He patented a variety of methods, including gas, recoil, and blowback, which were all intended to eject the spent cartridge from the gun and load the next bullet into the chamber. 
Hmm. Eventually, the finished Maxim gun would store and transfer the energy from the recoil through a device called a toggle lock. The Maxim gun was less labor-intensive than previous rapid-firing guns. It was water-cooled, which allowed it to maintain a longer rate of fire than the previous air-cooled weapons. The Maxim gun could fire 600 rounds per minute, which was three times the amount of the Gatling gun. The trade-off here being that the Maxim gun was heavier and more complex and required a supply of water to cool it. Maxim demonstrated the first prototype of his weapon in October of 1884, and initially sales began slow. His Maxim gun company received financing and eventually merged with other gun manufacturers to boost its popularity. Mm. Maxim improved his invention by also developing a smokeless gunpowder called Cordite, and eventually it was adopted for use by the British Army in 1889. One year later, the Austrian, German, Italian, Swiss, and Russian armies also began to purchase the Maxim gun. So, I mean, what's the difference between this and the machine gun? Or is this like the, is this a machine gun or or the predecessor to the machine gun? It sort of is a machine gun. So machine gun is kind of like a generic term, sort of like a, any machine operated gun, basically. I, I, that's like a terrible definition, but like the Gatling gun is in some way a machine gun. The difference between the Gatling gun and the Maxim gun is that the Maxim gun did not require continuous operation from an individual you basically you pull the trigger once and the gun reloads itself whereas the gatling gun you had to continuously crank so while they're both technically machine guns because they are operated and fire rapidly through the use of this mechanized device um, what made the maxim gun unique was that it reloaded itself continuously by using this blowback force so it didn't need someone to continuously operate it once the trigger was pulled it would continue to fire until all of the bullets were spent gotcha so let's talk about the legacy of the maxim gun historian martin gilbert referred to the maxim gun as quote the weapon most associated with imperial conquest which is not what i expected when i began searching this (laughs) (laughs) but that's probably something that we don't know enough about as americans so The Maxim gun was used heavily by European powers in their rush to conquer and imperialize African territories. There's a long list of these smaller wars and conflicts in Africa where the Maxim gun was used, and often the presence of the gun alone was enough to scare enemies of the British and the other European armies, but of course other times the gun was used to slaughter enemies by the thousands. Of course. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. In one example in 1893, during the Matabili War... 50 British soldiers were able to fight off 5,000 Matabili warriors with only four Maxim guns. The Maxim gun also played a prominent role in the Russo-Japanese War, World War I, the Russian Civil War and Revolution, and through its future variants, World War II and the Korean War. Historians have debated whether or not the Maxim gun has killed more people than any other gun in history. Wow. In the book, The Social History of the Machine Gun, Author John Ellis wrote, quote, without Hiram Maxim, much of the subsequent world history might have been different. Interesting. I guess we could pause right here because I, I have a question for you to get your moral opinion on this. Yeah. How how much of the damage that the Maxim gun caused do you think we can blame on its inventor? I don't know. I mean, I, I think I don't think we can entirely place blame upon him. Because he just made it, and I also feel like there were probably other innovators and inventors at his heels that would have made something similar um, in the years following his invention anyway. But I do think, I mean, I guess I do place a little bit of moral responsibility on him, because the more people that decide to not make things like this, the harder it is for them to eventually be made. So I, I blame him a little bit, but I don't think he's entirely responsible for all of the death caused by the Maxim gun. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't think that like if he hadn't invented it, that nobody ever would have, because we did talk about at this time in history, like governments were looking for new military technologies. And this was specifically one thing that they were trying to develop was a fully automatic weapon. Um, And I mean, we even talked about, other inventors that were working on very similar projects. So I I think it would have come out one way or another. I guess the part where I have the hang up with Hiram Maxim is that it 
I mean, with with the Gatling gun, like he had some kind of noble reason for inventing it. Like he thought it would help save lives by making wars end quicker. Whereas I get the sense that with Hiram Maxim, he just was kind of looking for the payday. Like (laughs) that's almost what inspired him to turn to inventing weapons was that he knew there was money in it. Right. Yeah, I guess I I place blame on him for that decision because usually knowing there's money in weapons means that the people buying them are going to use the weapons. And I don't know. I feel like the Maxim gun was used for more than just Europeans killing each other. Not that that would have made it any better, but it's (laughs) used in like imperial conquest by especially Britain, I think was pretty horrific and I don't know. I I like to think that maybe I would have the foresight to be like, I'm not going to invent this, even <laughs> for the payday. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think we can really say, like, Maxim is at fault for all the death and destruction that it caused, because, like, you wouldn't blame the inventor of the car, or even, like, Henry Ford for every car accident that's caused by a Ford. Right. But, like, there is some sense of responsibility for the future consequences of something that you work to create i think and at at least some kind of moral i guess impact on it or on how you feel about it and i i just don't get the sense that hiram maxim had that kind of remorse for what he invented and the damage that it caused right so maxim became a naturalized british subject on september 16th 1899 That same year, Queen Victoria bestowed knighthood upon him for his service to the empire through his invention, which made his proper name Sir Hiram Stevens Maxim. While profiting off his gun patents, he changed his focus to work on aviation, which we discussed earlier in the episode. Late in life, he was essentially deaf after years of experimenting with his guns, (laughs) and he died at his home in London on November 24th, 1916. At the time of his death, he held 122 U.S. patents and 149 British patents. How many patents do you hold, Phil? I currently don't hold any, but I got some stuff in the works. Yeah. <laughs> got, the, got some things in the in the garage that you're working on. Yeah, yeah. Tinkering, you know. I won't give anything away. I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want people copying my designs. Sure, of course. (laughs) So we didn't talk too much about Maxim's personal life. I want to just briefly cover it just because it kind of, I think, gives you some background on the type of person that he was and why we maybe don't have great feelings about him, or at least I don't. Um, He was known for being very opinionated and self-centered. His autobiography is full of petty grudges and blaming his assistants for some of his failures. For example, his feud with Thomas Edison and why he believes that he didn't get credit for that invention yeah maxim actually did try to work with his brother hudson for a while but eventually he became jealous of his brother's talents so after hudson returned to america he believed that hiram had actually hired someone to follow him around and interfere with his own work (laughs) oh my god hiram was married twice With his first wife, Jane Budden, he fathered a son and two daughters, and his son, Hiram Percy Maxim, would actually go on to become an inventor himself, as well as a pioneer in radio. His second wife, Sarah Haynes, was his secretary and mistress, who he married possibly before he was even legally divorced from Budden. Saucy. (laughs) And he was accused of having fathered an illegitimate child with a third woman, which the case was settled for a small amount, but in his will, he left money to a man who is believed to be the son of this other woman. So it kind of interesting. maybe justifies that thought that he did have an illegitimate child as well. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I just don't have a great moral view of Hiram Maxim. And that, right. I think, he, I, I think he deserves to be looked back on history as a great inventor. He clearly did a lot and accomplished a lot. And I mean, some of his inventions were very notable and very beneficial. I just get the sense that he was just kind of this very arrogant, self-centered guy that also invented some pretty dangerous stuff that maybe didn't benefit the world in necessarily great ways. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, 
I think he should have stayed focused more on the beneficial and inventions and had a, a bit more humility and then I'd consider him a, a better person than I currently do but I'm on board with your yeah your view of him <laughs> I mean it's kind of contrary to that quote that we talked about earlier with being more creditable to invent a killing machine than an apparatus to prevent human suffering like if he had stuck to inventing yeah. beneficial things like inhalers and other medical devices like that I think that is very noble in its own right but what he felt through his or people's reaction to those inventions was the opposite of how we're we're talking about him now. Like people thought that the the beneficial things he invented were not good or not worthy of fame or money, whereas inventing right. the weapons was. So that's kind of why his story took that turn to invent much more dangerous and deadly things. Yeah. So I think we can wrap up his story sort of in the same way that it started by talking about the other mysterious inventor, Mr. William Cantello. So after Cantello's disappearance, his sons had not seen him since the early 1880s, but they did come across a photo of Hiram Maxim in a newspaper as Maxim began to gain popularity throughout England due to his invention of the Maxim gun. Oddly, Maxim looked exactly like Cantello, their father, who had been working on a very similar automatic weapon only a few years Mm. earlier. According to reports from local newspapers, the two brothers tracked down Maxim to a train station at Waterloo, but were unsuccessful in getting his attention. Now, it seems unlikely that Hiram Maxim would actually be William Cantello, though they were about the same age, had very similar large Victorian beards, but that would have been a common style at the time. Both of them have well-documented and clearly separate lives, at least up until Cantella's disappearance. And it's not unreasonable to think that multiple inventors would have been working on an automatic rapid-firing machine gun around that time. So while they are similar, they probably weren't the same guy that just kind of changed his name when he, yeah. <laughs> when he moved to London or vice versa. I remember Maxim. Maxim did seem like a made-up name. <laughs> Maxim. Yeah, I I guess a little bit. (laughs) There are, however, some weird overlaps in their story. It's documented that Maxim at some point visited Cantella's hometown while working on his invention. And Maxim had been accused of having a reputation for brain sucking, which more (laughs) or less means stealing other people's ideas. Oh, I was was thinking he was a zombie. (laughs) What's ironic is that he accused other people of doing the same thing to him, which I guess is probably true of a lot of inventors at this time that they were all trying to come up with similar ideas at the same time. So naturally they accused other people of stealing each other's ideas. (laughs) Of course. Millions, millions, uh, millions of dollars probably relied on making sure you were the first one to the, the patent. So yeah, can see and history. Look at his experience with Edison. Yeah, everyone knows Thomas Edison. Not everyone knows Hiram Maxim. That's that's true. In his autobiography, Maxim also claimed that he had quote a double running around the U.S. impersonating him, and we know that Cantella was tracked to the U.S. So it's possible that this double could have been in reference to him, but it's probably more likely that Maxim was talking about his brother Hudson, who obviously would have looked similar <laughs> to him and was also doing invention work in the u.s oh my goodness a little (laughs) little bit of paranoia for you for real so could maxim have potentially stolen cantella's idea to create this maxim gun it's probably more likely a weird coincidence although it still doesn't explain cantella's disappearance which is likely why the two sons thought that they recognized maxim as their own father yeah spooky (laughs) i wanted to include that i mean I guess if we're calling Hiram Maxim the B-sider here, I guess William Cantella would be like the C-sider to it. The C-sider. Yeah. Someone that we really don't have much information on at all besides his working on an invention and then disappearing. And it is a really cool, weird story that lines up perfectly with Hiram Maxim, but yeah, I'm pretty sure they're different guys. <laughs> all right. Where are, you? are you ready for your quiz? You think you've uh, got a good shot? I mean, we've talked about how uh, neither of us are real big gun guys, so I guess we'll find out. I'm a huge, huge gun nut. I have a picture of Hiram Maxim above my bed. 
<laughs> to go along with uh, Barley's picture of Sergeant Stubby. I think that yeah. might have been on a bonus episode that you mentioned that, so people might not get Probably. that joke. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back. Welcome back. As many of our listeners know, we like to end every episode with a short quiz for our host to test his research and knowledge, and also to give you, our listener, a chance to test your own historical knowledge around our topic. So we got three questions lined up for you, Phil. All right. All about, either about the Maxim gun or Hiram Maxim himself. Oh, wow. I feel like I did a lot of research, so... Hopefully, uh, yeah, it was hard. I remember it was it. hard finding questions. <laughs> I mean, this is one that I researched quite a bit before we actually sat down to record it, so I probably forgot some stuff too. I guess we'll we'll see how yeah. it goes. <laughs> so, your first question has more to do with the Maxim Gun Company. Um, you mentioned during the episode that the Maxim Gun Company was founded in 1884 and later absorbed into another firearms and armaments manufacturer. Can you name? that manufacturer oh man. i will say there were several iterations of this company yeah i'll take just the last name of the family who started and owned it so i i definitely don't remember the name of it like i said it's been a while since i researched it but i do remember reading it there was several of these companies that were like the main weapons used by the militaries in europe at that time so when yeah. the Maxim gun came out, they were had a lot to do with why it didn't sell well initially because they tried to give it some really bad PR to keep it from becoming like the the weapon of choice by militaries. And then yeah. eventually they they bought the Maxim gun company and that's really when it took off. So I I don't remember the name of the specific company though. That's a great question. I wish I remembered it. Yeah. Uh, so it was Vickers Limited. Yeah. Which Vickers. was an offshoot of the Vickers company, Edward Vickers was a steel entrepreneur, um, steel production business owner, and then his son Albert Vickers is the one that took the company in a more weapons-focused direction. And they, like I said, the company has been named like 18 different things over the yeah. years, depending on what they owned and what they made. But yeah, um, that's a good. At some question. point, <laughs> yeah, at some point, the gun even became known as the Vickers Maxim gun. One of the versions yeah. that was released was the Vickers Maxim. That was one of those like. Definitely on topic. You got to read a little more than what we put in the episode to get it. And... Right. Oh, well. For your second question, while the first Matabele War is often cited as the first time the Maxim gun saw action, this is not the case. The Maxim gun was in fact first used in 1887 by the expedition to rescue Emin Pasha, the cutoff governor of Equatoria, by the British Army in Africa. Can you tell me what african city it was first used in wait, wait what was the country again at the time the country was equatoria well that's not true at the time they were rescuing the governor of equatoria who had been cut off from other british forces and there was this expedition to find him which cut basically through the middle of africa to the eastern coast and then a little bit down each coast i don't know how much about african geography you know but yeah that should help you narrow down your cities so this is a city that i should definitely know maybe i don't know it's <laughs> I, I like i know it it's a major oh, city man. in the country that it's in my mind is blanking on cities in africa outside of like egyptian cities and south africa which are not where we're looking I'll, I'll narrow it down for you and say that it's in present day kenya i don't know if that helps you <laughs> how many kenyan cities you can name my mind is just blank <laughs> go ahead <laughs> so it was first used in mombasa on the okay. coast the eastern coast in kenya um they basically the expedition headed east, hit the coast just south of Mombasa, near where Zanzibar is, and they went up and then down the coast from their kind of meeting point with the water. And as they went north, they first would have hit Mombasa, and that's where they used the Maxim gun for the first time. 
I have just mow down city. indigenous people. <laughs> Jeez. I've heard of that city. I would not have gotten that by sitting here trying that to was, think of African cities. It was definitely it was definitely a hard <laughs> question. As is your next question. Great. Which might require more geography, but probably not. So as we've talked about, the Maxim gun was an invention quite a while ago. It was used, you know, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. But in fact, its most recent documented use was 2016. Oh, There's no. a video released of what country using the Maxim gun as recently as 2016. And I will tell you it is the M19, well, I should say M1910 Maxim machine gun that predates World War I. And there's a specific country's military that is still, at least as of 2016, using one. Oh, and I have man. a hint for this one, too, if you have no idea. I mean, my guess is that it wouldn't be a super developed country, but I'll take the hint. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a hyper developed country, but I will say they got this Maxim gun, the stocks of this, of the Maxim gun from Soviet reserves that were left, which should narrow down the possible countries. So my guess is that it's in Eastern Europe somewhere. It is in Eastern Europe. Oh, Western Asia, Eastern Europe. I'm not really sure which. <laughs> so is it like Turkey or maybe Ukraine? It is, it is Ukraine. It is okay. not Turkey. Yeah. <laughs> I was between so those two. <laughs> in, yeah. In 2016, a video was released that shows the Ukrainian military actively using the M1910 Maxim machine gun. Wow. That's... I, I mean, it's kind of cool, I guess, because, I, I mean, now we view these as, like, old guns and, like, there's some kind of yeah. historical whatever aspect to it. But it's also kind of scary that, like, there are modern militaries that still use that kind of technology. Yeah. Because it, it just, I mean, clearly weapons today are much more powerful and dangerous, but, like, it seems unsafe that there, <laughs> there are modern militaries that use old weapons like that it is pretty wild and i mean even further they're using it to they were using it to fight off russian forces after their illegal seizure of the crimean peninsula so they weren't just using the maxim gun on like i don't know rebels or bands of mm -hmm. you know political bandits or whatever you want to say they were using it against a major country yeah that's cool i mean not cool so but like that's cool that you <laughs> I, I like that as a trivia question. I thought that was a cool trivia question, I guess. Yeah, I kind of stumbled upon it. Wow. <laughs> so, still in use as of, I don't know, my graduation from college. <laughs> 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 Which I feel like is well over 100 years of use. I mean... Well, you, yeah, you said it was a pre-1910 weapon? I think M1910 probably stands for the year it was released or made. But it's pre World War Two or World War One, pre World War One, so it has to at least be nineteen thirteen. Yeah. So yeah, a hundred years of Hiring death innovation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yay, well, <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys for uh, tuning in to another episode of History's B Side. Uh, it's kind of interesting when we do these people that, I guess, not even bad people, but had a questionable impact on history and humanity so it, it's fun to talk about this stuff and to think about it but obviously the, the conversation carries some weight as well and hope we uh did some justice in the way we talked about it yeah thank you so much for tuning in uh if you want any more history's b-side please feel free to follow along on facebook twitter instagram youtube at history's b-side we appreciate your comments, questions, suggestions, and corrections when they're nice to us <laughs> uh, <laughs> by emailing us historiesbside at gmail.com. Thanks again. We will see you next week. Thanks for listening. History's B-Side is an independent, listener-supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service. 
and follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Histories B-Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at historiesbside at gmail.com. You can donate to the show at buymeacoffee.com slash historiesbside. While you're there, check out our membership perks, merchandise, and more. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Melito and Phil Hall. Thanks for listening to History's B-Side.